In this video cast, we'll look at organic chemistry in an introduction that's given in chapter 25 of your general chemistry textbook. Make sure that you have paper and a pencil available during this video cast as you will be instructed to write down all notes and example problems that occur during these notes. These video cast notes do not have a fill in the blank guide. They're just simply on a blank piece of paper. It's also very helpful for you to have chapter 25 of your textbook out in front of you as I'll refer to this chapter quite often. And this chapter talks about the introduction to organic and biological chemistry. So make sure you've got your book out, a pencil, a piece of paper, Pause the video now until you've got those things in front of you. Organic chemistry is many, by many people defined as the chemistry of living or once living things. And generally, living or once living things all contained one element. And that one element that all those things have in common is the element carbon. Carbon on the periodic table is in group 14. Its element is, uh, has six protons and six electrons, and its atomic mass is 12, and it likes to form four bonds with lots of different things, generally nonmetals, but many, many other things. And this chemistry of carbon, of living or once living things, is an entire course, or several courses, in college chemistry. We're going to do a short introduction which might not seem very short because it's going to be at least a half an hour, of some general characteristics of organic molecules. And then we're going to take a look at some very specific areas of carbon with hydrogen as well. First of all, let's take a look at uh, some structures. Structures uh, of organic molecules generally are governed by the bonds that carbon forms. Carbon likes to form four different bonds or bonding areas with just about anything. You'll never find a carbon that has less than four bonds. Not saying that some of them can't be a double or a triple bond, but generally they'll form more than, uh, it never more and never less than four bonds with something. Now, there are two different classifications that we'll take a look at of uh, different organic molecules. And the first class is called alkanes. Alkanes generally are what are known as saturated carbons or saturated hydrocarbons. And then there are the alkenes and the alkynes. Notice this is a Y-N-E, an E-N-E, and an A-N-E ending. And these are known as unsaturated carbons. And the general rule of thumb is saturated means that a carbon has four single bonds all around it. Whereas unsaturated carbons generally mean that a carbon has a double bond or a triple bond coming off of it. And remember, since carbon can only form four bonds total, a triple bond would mean that the carbon's only bonded to one other thing. A double bond would mean that it's only bonded to two other things. Or it could have two double bonds, which is a possibility as well. Saturated hydrocarbons or saturated alkanes all have single bonds when they're connected to other carbons or hydrogens or other things. That's the rules between saturated and unsaturated. And things that are alkanes always end with an A-N-E ending. Things that are alkenes and have a double bond always end with an E-N-E ending. And things that have a triple bond always end in a Y-N-E ending. Ein versus in versus ein. The last type of hydrocarbons, which isn't really in alkenes, alkanes or alkynes, alkanes, alkenes or alkynes, are ones that are called aromatic. And aromatic hydrocarbons generally form a ring, generally form a ring. And they're ones that uh, lots of times have double bonds. And one aromatic hydrocarbon that you learned about a while ago in this class is one that's known as benzene. And it forms this 
resonance double bond throughout the cyclic structure. And of course, there's only one carbon, um, I'm sorry, one hydrogen attached to each carbon, and this takes the formula C6H6. And we'll look at some of those ringed structures as well. So let's take them one at a time. We'll start with alkanes, then we'll move to alkenes and alkynes. We'll look at some aromatics, and after that, we'll take a look at uh, some derivatives of those as well. First ones are known as alkanes. Alkanes, ending in A-N-E, have single bonds. And the single bonded structures take on these formulas. C to the N, H to the 2, N plus 2. C to the N, H to the 2, N plus 2. And so the formulas are C, H, 4, C, 2, H, 6, C, 3, H, 8, C, 4, H, 10, etc. And if you want to see a whole bunch of them in the 10th edition of the book, look on page 1068, and I'll just put that in front of you here for a second. You can see a number of these right here in this chart, where we've got the C to the N, H to the 2N formula. Here's the condensed structural formula for each one, and you can see the names, meth, eth, pro, but, pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec. And notice they all end in A-N-E, ain meaning that they are alkanes and only have single bonds. And you can see how the boiling point increases as the molecular weight increases too because the London dispersion forces increase. A little shoot back there to chapter 11 when we talked about intermolecular forces. Now a couple of characteristics about these alkanes. When you draw the structural formula for them, make sure that you only put single bonds between them, three carbons in a row, and then take your hydrogens and bond them around the carbons. So all the carbons always end up having a total of four bonds around them. This is the, this is the expanded structural formula for an alkane called uh, propane. Pro meaning three, pain, prop meaning three, ane meaning that it's all single bonds. Now, let's take a look at a little bit different way you could draw this butane molecule. Butane, but meaning four, and then ane meaning a, uh, uh, a single bonded hydrocarbon has four carbons and ten hydrogens. And the general way to draw normal butane, which is sometimes abbreviated N-butane, N meaning normal or just in the normal row or all in a line. Another way to draw this would to take and break a bond, still have four carbons, but have it arranged in a different way. So for example, I could have three carbons in a row and one carbon coming off of the side. Now when I did this, I still want to make sure that every carbon has four bonds around it, and of course fill in hydrogens wherever there's one of those bonds. And this one, two, three, four carbon structure would be what's known as an isomer, an isomer of normal butane. Notice it's almost the same, it still has four carbons, but notice the four carbons are not in a row. These isomers that can occur of many different hydrocarbons still have the same number of carbons and the same molecular formula, C4H10, but they're arranged differently. And so to be an isomer, it's something that has the same molecular formula, but a different arrangement of atoms in the structure. A different arrangement of atoms in the structure. And sometimes there's many different isomers of a particular compound, and that's been a common question actually, is to draw a number of different isomers of a particular uh, hydrocarbon. Uh, on the AP exam, they've last asked that. If you look at page 1069 in your textbook, you can see some three-dimensional models of these. You can see right here, here's a structure of butane. 
Notice that's normal butane or N-butane. And then right here you can see here's what's known as isobutane. Or this one is also called 2-methylpropane. And you can see that this one's got the carbon coming off of the second carbon. It's the same overall molecular formula. Same overall molecular formula. It's just arranged differently and that's why it's called iso or an isomer of another one. You can see another example down here with pentane. And then here is are, are, uh, is an isomer of it called isobutane, or isopentane, I'm sorry, 2-methylbutane. Two 2-methyl, two so you can notice that there's a single carbon group coming off of the chain. And you can see here, it's a single carbon group coming off that chain. You can see that there's a third possible isomer here as well, where we have kind of like a star shaped. We still have one, two, three, four, five carbons. But they're all coming off the central carbon. And so it's another isomer of pentane. This is known as either neopentane or 2,2-dimethylpropane. We'll go through how to name those now. So you can become kind of adept at figuring out what the names of these different isomers are. I'm going to use another example. I'm going to use another example uh, to help to help you see how to name various isomers. Let's take this example, C6H14. This, in its normal form, is just called hexane. And if I drew normal hexane, or N-hexane, I would just draw it as six carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, five, six, with hydrogens coming off of each of the carbons. This expanded structural formula shows where each hydrogen, each carbon, and each bond sits in this N-hexane. Whereas I could also draw a condensed structural formula where I would take this CH3 group and write it as CH3, this CH2 group and write it as CH2, this group also CH2, and then this group would be CH2, CH2, and then one, two, three, four, five. The sixth one right here would also be written as CH3. This condensed structural formula is the same as this one. It's just a, like a quicker way of writing it. And it assumes that you as a chemist know that each of those hydrogens forms a bond about the carbon, and these would have bond angles of about 109 degrees or so, spacing themselves out into a uh, tetrahedral arrangement. Now, I could break bonds in this n-hexane, put it together in another way, put it together in another way, so I'd still have six carbons, but they'd be arranged in a different way. For example, let's say I had five carbons, in a row, and I added a sixth carbon off of the next to the last carbon in the chain. Now, next to the last is a relative term. Next to the last is a relative term because if I count the carbons, one, two, three, four, five in a row, it's off of the fourth carbon. But if I count the longest chain of carbons as one, two, three, four, five, now, all of a sudden, this carbon comes off of the second carbon. Or, how about I count the longest carbon chain this way? One, two, three, four, five. Now, this is not a substituent group anymore. This is. Now, let's back up for just a second. If I have a group coming off of a carbon, say, for instance, this one right here, and it has one carbon and three hydrogens, this group is known as a methyl group. A methyl group because it has one carbon, three hydrogens coming off of it. If I would have a group coming off of here that it would have two carbons in a row, I would call it an ethyl group. A C2H5 would be called an ethyl group. If I had C3H7 coming off of it, I would call it a propyl group. Notice it's a YL ending because it's just a group or a substituent group that comes off of the longest chain of carbons. Now you have to be very careful when numbering the longest chain of carbons because as you saw before, I could number it from left to right. I could have a bend in it like this. I could number it from right to left. And I could also, uh, you know, attempt to count the longest chain of carbons another way, too. I could count it this way. One, two, three. Notice 
I'd, say, I'd be saying three is my longest chain of carbons, and this, of course, would not be correct because there would be another way of counting the longest chain of carbons to get a bigger number than three. And so when you name something like this that is an isomer of a longer normal chain, normal chained hydrocarbon, rule number one is that you must number the longest chain. And it doesn't matter whether you number it from left to right, you have a twist in it, a bend in it, as long as it's continuously connected. This longest chain determines the overall name of the hydrocarbon. Since there are five in a row here, one, two, three, four, five, the name is going to be uh, the name for five carbons, which is pentane. Now, you might jump up and down and say, yeah, but you just told me that this is an isomer of hexane, which it is, which it is. But we're going to indicate off of the longest chain called pentane where this sixth carbon goes. So when you see the name, you can draw the structural formula for it. Off of the second carbon in the chain, and I want to number the chain so the substituent group, this methyl group, has the smallest possible number, there is a methyl group, one, two. And so I'll say two methyl pentane, two methyl pentane. That means off of the second carbon, there's a methyl group. And when I draw these structures, I always like to read them backwards. So if you're given a name, read it from backwards to forward and say, oh, it's a pentane. Okay, so draw a pentane. One, two, three, four, five. And off of the second carbon, there's a methyl group. Okay, one, two. There's a methyl group coming off there. I'll write it as CH3 right now just to condense it. And then off of these carbons, of course, there'd be hydrogens. So every carbon ends up having four bonds around it. Now, this one right here, even though I omitted the hydrogens, is exactly the same as this isomer here, except I just flipped it around. Except I just flipped it around. So let's name a few of these. But before we name a few of these, I want to show you a shorthand method. A shorthand method for drawing chemical uh, organic structures. Instead of drawing all these carbons and all the hydrogens all the time, many times in a longer structure like this one, for example, that has carbons and hydrogens coming off of it. I'll put a couple more on here just for fun. And this is a CH3 right here. We can draw what's called a stick model. And a stick model assumes that you know at a chemist, as a chemist, that if I just illustrate the bonds, these bonds right here, this bond right here, this one right here, this one right here, as a stick, that there's going to be a carbon that's saturated. In other words, it has four bonds attached to it. And if I don't show a special bond uh, to something that's attached to it, I assume that it is a hydrogen. So for example, the stick model for this one would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This stick model would represent this model of, in this case, it would be um, pentane because it has one, two, three, four, five carbons. At the end of each one of these sticks, or at the bend in each stick, it is assumed that you know there are the number of hydrogens necessary to make it be a saturated hydrocarbon. I don't have to draw these hydrogens in like I'm doing because it's assumed that you know that. And this squiggly line right here just would represent that it's five carbons in a row and they're all single bonds. Now when we move on in a little while and we talk about alkenes and alkynes, we'll actually be able to draw these with a double bond as well. I could draw something like this and put a double bond right there and that would indicate that there's a carbon here, a carbon here, a carbon here, a carbon here, and attached to each one of the carbons is enough hydrogens to make it so it's a saturated compound. In other words, uh, uh, I, I think I used the word saturated incorrectly. Enough bonds so every carbon has four things, four bonds attached to it. Okay, using that shorthand method now, let's see if we can draw a few isomers and name them. Let's start with a formula like this. 
And if I draw the actual structural formula for that, remember there's carbon, 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 and a carbon down here. So it would look like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven carbons in a row. And then off of the one, two, three, third carbon, one, two, three, from this direction, there would be another carbon. And they'd all have enough hydrogens so it would be saturated with, or I, I, once again, I'm using the word wrong, it would have enough hydrogens so every carbon would have four bonds around it. This and this are identical structures, but of course this one's a lot easier to draw. Now to name this isomer, I want to find the longest chain of hydrocarbons first. The longest chain of hydrocarbons here would start so I could name the substituent group, or the group that sticks off of there, so I could name that with the lowest possible number. So I can see I could number it one of two ways. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or I could number it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Both of them would end up giving me the longest chain of seven carbons in a row, which is known as heptane. But the green lettering that I used would cause this substituent group, known as a methyl group, to be off of the third carbon, not off of the fifth, like the red numbering would do. And so I want to number my carbons from right to left in this case to give the methyl group the smallest possible number. So one, two, three, I'd call it three methyl Heptane. Three methyl heptane means that off of the third carbon of the longest chain, there's a methyl group. Let's try another one. Let's say, for example, this time I have this. And off of here and off of here, I have methyl groups. Now, I have to number the longest chain, so my methyl group here and my methyl group here would have the lowest possible numbers. I could number it this direction, one, two, three, four, five, or I could number it this way, one, two, three, four, five. It looks to me like the best way to number it, so the substituent groups, this guy and this guy, would have the lowest possible number, would be this group being a two, and this group being a three. If I numbered it from left to right with the green numbers, I'd have one is three and one is four, which wouldn't be as low a number. Still, my longest chain is five, and so my root or my basic structure would be pentane. And then off of the pentane, at the second carbon, and at the third carbon, there's a methyl group. And so I can name those together. And I can say 2,3-dimethylpentane. Off of the second carbon, there's a methyl. And off of the third carbon, there's a methyl. And I use the prefix di to indicate that there's a total of two methyl groups coming off of the branched chains, a total of two. Now, if there was a second methyl coming off of here and a second methyl coming off of here, then I would have to number each of those, and I'd have to call it tetramethyl because there would be four total methyl groups coming off of it. And so in this case, if there was another group here and another group here, I'd have to number it 2, 2, 3, 3, tetramethyl pentane. Now, some people get confused by this because they say, why do you need to say tetra when you can count that there's four things right here? Well, that just indicates how many total methyl groups you have, not necessarily where they go. The numbers indicate to you uh, where the substituent groups come off because you can also use numbers to indicate other substituent groups that would come off of various carbons, whether it be a halogen or whether it be an ethyl group or maybe a propyl group in a larger molecule. And so it's always necessary to say how many there are and where each one of those comes off of there. Let's do a structural isomer where we have the name and we need to write the formula. Let's say, for example, that we have the formula or oh, I'm sorry, we have the, uh, the uh, uh, name 3-ethyl-2-4-5-trimethyl-hep-t. 
obtain. Now, my recommendation is always start from the right and work to the left. In other words, work backwards of the way you read. Read this part first and know that it's an aim, so you know it's going to be singly bonded heptane chain carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven carbons in a row. There's my heptane. Next, look backwards this way and see that off of the second, fourth, and fifth carbons, there will be methyl groups. So if I'm going to go from left to right, which is fine, number this one one, off of the second one there will be a methyl, off of the three, fourth one there will be a methyl, and off of the fifth one there will be a methyl group. So two, four, and five have a methyl group coming off of them. And lastly, off of the third carbon, there will be an ethyl group, one, two, three, and an ethyl group I can illustrate like this, where I have one, two carbons coming off of that third group. Now, this is the condensed uh, stick model formula, but of course I could draw it another way as well. And if you look in your book, this is the 10th edition once again, on page 1071, you can see this 3-ethyl, 245 trimethyl heptane drawn in kind of a neat way where they actually have some bends in it, and you can see the condensed structural formula here off of the second carbon, a methyl, off of the third carbon, an ethyl, off of the fourth, a methyl, off of the fifth, a methyl, and there's six and seven. Notice that the straight, this isn't necessarily just a straight chain. It's kind of snaky as it goes through, and you have to be aware of that, that when you count these things, you've got to follow along to find out what the longest possible chain is. When there's two or more substituent groups listed, always list them in alphabetical order. And notice there's an ethyl group here, and there's a trimethyl group right here. And you can see that that's uh, listed alphabetically, ethyl methyl, ethyl trimethyl, uh, EE comes before uh, the methyl groups. And then um, let's take a look and let's see if we can name another kind of crazy looking one. I'm going to draw this one out in kind of a semi-expanded structure. and see if we can name this hydrocarbon. First step is to always figure out what the longest chain is. And so we're going to try to number this longest chain by connecting it to have the, the, the longest possible chain identified, even though it might curve. So I'm going to start, just, just, just to kind of break out of the box, I'm going to start right up here in the upper left-hand corner and call this carbon one, two, three. If I went here, it'd be four, but it looks like the chain could continue longer. This could be four. I could go this way, and this would be the fifth carbon, but it looks like I have more over here, so I'll call this five, six, and notice it bounces back over here, so it's a chain of seven carbons that way. Now, I could number it the other direction, too, and I could call this carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I want to take a look at it, and I want to decide which one is going to give my substituent groups then, one here and one here, the smallest possible numbers. If I look at my blue numbering right here, I can see that off of this carbon right here, it will either have a number of three or a number of five. Off of this carbon right here, it'll either have a number of four or four, so it doesn't make any difference. So this one determines kind of that I should number it from left to right. So my carbon, of uh, the third carbon right here, ends up being the one that is uh, the smallest possible number. So when I name this one now, I'm going to call it heptane because there are seven carbons in it and it ends in A-N-E because it's all single bonds. And off of the third carbon, there's a methyl group. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, off of the third carbon, there's a methyl group. And off of the fourth carbon, there's a methyl group. So I have to name them both three, four, and then put di methyl in front of it. Notice I say dimethyl because there's two methyl groups coming off of there. So that's naming and writing some different isomers of some structural formulas.
let's take a look at another classification of of uh, alkanes, and this other classification of alkanes are known as cycloalkanes. Cycloalkanes are ones that reside in a circle or in a ring, I guess would be better. For example, I could have this one that I have. One, two, three, four, five carbons in a row. And of course, off of here, I would have to have two hydrogens for each one because then each carbon would end up having four bonds. And it doesn't matter which side I put the carbons off of. It doesn't even matter if I write it as CH2, as long as I'm indicating there are enough carbons. And of course, a shorthand way for chemists that are used to drawing these would be simply to draw it like this. And at each corner, I know I'd have a carbon that has enough bonds to hydrogens to make sure that every carbon has four, four bonds off of it. This, since it's in a cycle, would be named with the prefix cyclo. And then it would always end with the number of carbons with an ane ending. And since this is five carbons in a row, I'd use the prefix pent and then the ending ane. So this would be called cyclopentane. Now you could have another one like this. This triangle shaped thing has one, two, three carbons. And so this would be called cyclopropane. It's just another way of drawing single bonded carbons in a ring. Single bonded carbons in a ring. Our next group of hydrocarbons we're going to look at are ones that have double bonds. And these are called alkenes. Alkenes, the E-N-E -E ending, means that we have a carbon-carbon double bond somewhere in the structure. Somewhere in the structure. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have only one double bond. You could have more than one, but you more than likely will have uh, at least one double bond in there, and it will always be ended with the E N E. Now, these make uh, the structural formula a little bit unique because since we have a double bond here and the carbons connecting it will also have two other bonds, this bonding characteristic gives me one sigma and one pi bond in the molecule. And since sigma bonds are head-to-head -head orbital overlap, and the pi bonds actually happen between the lobes above and below the carbon, it causes it so this part of the formula, or this part of the structure, cannot rotate. Cannot rotate. And so it's kind of fixed. It's fixed. And so if you have different structures stuck off of each end, like a chlorine and a chlorine, and then a hydrogen and a hydrogen, notice that the chlorines are both above the carbons and the hydrogens are both below. This leads for some interesting isomers of alkenes. Alkenes like this, for example, could have an isomer like this with chlorines on both sides. And then we could have another one where the chlorines are opposite of one another. And I didn't draw the unshared pairs of electrons around the chlorine like I should. This type of isomer, where the chlorines are both on the same side, are known as cis isomers because they're on the cis same side. They kind of sound the same. Where the chlorines are opposite of each other, this isomer is known as the trans isomer, or the transverse, or the opposite of one another. These cis and trans isomers, these cis and trans isomers are known as geometric isomers of one another because they have the same formula. They have the same formula. Both have C2H2Cl2 for the formula. Both have that formula. But one has the chlorines on the same side. One has the chlorines transverse of each other. These can make for some interesting or some different physical characteristics, like boiling point, melting point, and the way that they react with other things. When we come back in our next video cast, we'll move on from alkenes and look at alkynes and many other functional groups.
In this video cast, we'll continue our talk about unsaturated hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons in general. When we left off the first video cast, we were talking about things called alkenes. Alkenes are a classification of unsaturated hydrocarbons that contain a double bond. Make sure that you have a piece of paper like this in front of you, a pencil or a pen, and you can write down all of these notes as they appear. And then you can try some of the problems as we go along, and I'll ask you to pause the video, try the problem, and see if you can obtain the understanding. Alkenes end in E-N-E, -E, and the E-N-E -E ending means that there's a double bond in the structure. There could be more than one double bond, and the number of double bonds are usually indicated by a prefix on the ending. It tells you diene, triene, tetraene, depending on how many double bonds there are in the structure. The simplest alkene is C with two H's, a double bond, and C with two H's. Notice the carbons still form the general rule that all carbons have to have four bonds around them. This is known, since there are two carbons, as ethene, or sometimes it's called ethylene. Notice it ends in E and E, and either name is appropriate or okay. S, the prefix meaning two carbons, and en, meaning there's a double bond. The second most simple is with three carbons. And this contains one double bond, and of course it contains a single bond as well. And since there are three carbons, it is called propene, or sometimes propylene. Either name is correct. When you name propylene, or substances that have, uh, when you name propene or ethylene, uh, you can put the Y in either place, and it's okay as long as it still ends in E and E. The third structure that is an ene or an alkene would be four carbons in a row, so H3, C, C, double bond, and a C of which this would, of course, have two carbons attached, or hydrogens. This would have one, this would have two, and I wrote this one in kind of a condensed structural form. And this, of course, would be called butene, because there are four carbons, and there's a double bond. But since there are several different places that the double bond could go, here or here, you have to indicate where the double bond is. And you always number the carbon chain, so the double bond has the smallest possible number. And so you'd number the carbon chain 1, 2, 3, 4, and so it would be called 1-butene. If it's on the first carbon, it's generally just called butene. But that's kind of a slang name. The technical name is 1-butene, with the double bond on the first carbon. Now, if the double bond happened to be here, in the middle, and a single bond right here, now you'd have to call it 2-butene, because it's between the second and the third carbon. And you always want to number the groups. So the carbon that has the double bond has the lowest possible number. So you could number it this way, too. 1, 2, 3, 4, because this would be the second carbon, and it would have a double bond off of it. Now, there are several isomers that could come off of this as well. And this is where we kind of left off in the first video cast, that since this could have several substituent groups uh, off of it, you can notice that if the double bond is in the middle, we could draw the structure like this, with the CH3 group off of here and a hydrogen off of here, CH3 group off of here and a hydrogen off of here. And if you notice the way that I drew it, the double bond here does not allow rotation around the central axis because it has a sigma and a pi bond. And therefore, the substituent methyl groups are both on the same side of the double bond. This is known as a cis isomer. If the carbon-carbon double bond puts one methyl group transverse from the other, then this is known as a trans isomer. Now this can happen with methyl groups, or it could happen with other substituent groups such as bromine, chlorine, iodine, or other things that just stick off at the end. And so this would be known as cis-2-butene, and this would be known as trans 2 butene. Notice that the cis isomer places both substituent groups on the same side of the bond. The trans puts them transverse or opposite 
This can make for some interesting characteristics as far as physical properties go. And if you look on page 1075 of the 10th edition of your text, you'll notice that trans trans to butene actually has a boiling point of plus one degree Celsius and cis to butene actually has a boiling point of plus four degrees Celsius. And so you can see that the boiling points differ just by the way they're arranged, even though both of these isomers end up having the C4 four carbons and H8 number of hydrogens. One little note back up above here. Alkenes always have a uh, similar uh, structure, structure. Remember how alkanes were always C to the N, H to the 2N plus 2. Alkenes are always C to the N, H to the 2N. And they're named just the same as they are as alkanes, except for they have an E N E ending. So they use the same prefixes, methyl, propyl, pentax, hep, doc, non, doc, non, These unsaturated hydrocarbons called alkenes uh, that don't allow rotation around the center, c central bond, give rise to these unique isomers known as cis and trans. Let's move on to another type of unsaturated hydrocarbon. These types of unsaturated hydrocarbons are known as alkynes, Y-N-E-S. Alkynes contain a triple bond. A triple bond. The triple bond, of course, is stronger than the double bond, and the most common triple A bonded substance would be two carbons and two hydrogens. And alkynes always take on the formula C to the N, H to the N. C to the N, H to the 2N minus, I'm sorry, let me write that again. C to the N, H to the 2N minus 2. This would be called methine. Methine. Notice the Y N E ending. The second most common triple A bonded would have three carbons in it. And in this case, it would have four hydrogens around it here and one here. And follow the normal structural formula C to the N, H to the 2 N minus 2, which would be C3. H one two three four. Which would be two times three, which is six minus two or four. This would be known as propine. I made a mistake back up here. Not math. This should be called ethine because it has two carbons. I apologize. Methine, of course, can't exist because that would only be one carbon and there could be no triple bond between one carbon and itself. So this is called ethine, or sometimes it's called acetylene. Acetylene, of course, is a gas that's used in welding torches or in metalworks, and it burns uh, extremely hot. This is propine, and uh, this, of course, fits into the same... Um, same same um, format of C to the N, H to the 2, N minus 2. The third most common would be carbon, carbon, triple bond, and two more carbons. And this one, of course, would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, hydrogens around it. So it would be C, 4, H, 6. So 2, N, 8, minus 2 would be 6. Then this, of course, since it has four carbons, would be called butyne. Notice it has a Y N E N. Now, it is possible for the triple bond to move. And when the triple bond moves to a different place, then the uh, triple bond needs to be noted and you need to say where the triple bond is at. So butyne, of course, right here, could have several different structural isomers where we could take and put the triple bond in the middle. And we'd have the same number of carbons, four, and end up with six hydrogens, just the same as before, except for now notice that the triple bond is in the middle. And so this one would have to be identified as two butyne, 
where the two indicates where the triple bond is. This one would technically be called one butyne because the carbon triple bond came off of the first. The triple bond came off of the first carbon. Now, alkenes and alkynes both undergo similar types of reactions. The reactions that alkenes, remember with the double bond, and alkynes undergo that's common to them are one that are called addition reactions. And you don't need to memorize these, but you should be aware that they exist. And generally, with a, an addition reaction, what happens is the double bond is broken by some type of halogen chemical or uh, another type of chemical that's capable of breaking it. And once it breaks it, the halogen tacks on to the places where the double bond was. So in this case, we would create H2C with a Br off of it here, opening up that double bond and tacking the two bromines on to the carbon. This is also known as a halogenation addition reaction because a halogen was added to it. The pair of bonds that formed the du pi double bond right here are uncoupled and it's used to form two new bonds to the bromine atoms. Since pi bonds are a little bit weaker than sigma bonds, that's the bond that's broken in the addition reaction. Now, if you'd like to read more about addition reactions and some of their mechanisms, you can take a look on page 179, 1079, in the 10th edition of your textbook. Last classification after alkenes and alkynes is one that are known as aromatic hydrocarbons. Now, aromatic hydrocarbons are cyclic ones that contain what are known as a benzene ring. And a benzene ring, if you remember, are symbolized by this, where the double bonds are shared throughout the carbon atoms in a hexagonal shape. So it takes the form C6, H6. And remember that there is resonance going on about those double bonds. And so you know it's really like technically a bond and a half between each one of the carbons. Now, these aromatic hydrocarbons come from a ring known as benzene. And when these have substituent groups coming off of them, the substituent groups are also named. And so you could have a CH3 coming off of there. And it could be called methylbenzene. Now, technically, a methylbenzene also has another name. It's called a phenyl. But uh, I don't think that that's too important for you to actually have memorized. And if you want to look more at some of the setups of the aromatic hydrocarbons, you can take a look at page 1081 in your textbook. But realize that when they use the word aromatic, it means that there are benzene rings involved. We're now going to take a look at a number of functional groups. And these functional groups need to be recognizable to you. And we're going to make a list, and you're going to need a new piece of paper because there are nine different functional groups. I'm sorry, um, 12 different functional groups that we're going to take a look at. And the characteristics of uh, uh, naming and uh, the characteristic of their formulas that make them unique. So we're going to make a table of these. And we're going to put the uh, functional group in this first column. In the second column, we're going to put the name of the type of compound. In the third one, we're going to look at the suffix or the prefix that's used to help name them. Then we're going to give an example. And lastly, we're going to talk about the systematic name for that particular example. So hopefully these all fit on the screen. And we're going to go slot by slot. Some of them you all already have known and seen. Some of them will be brand new. The first one is the double bonded carbon. The double bonded carbon, remember, is called an alkene. The suffix of the prefix on this, of course, is E-N-E. -E. 
And an example of this would be a double bonded carbon with hydrogens on each side. And this is known as S-in. S, because there's two carbons, in, because there's a double bond between them. The second one is a triple bond. The triple bonded substance is known as an alkyne, Y-N-E. An alkyne has a triple bond, and of course would have one sigma and two pi bonds, making it stronger than a double bond, but not three times as strong as a single bond, because remember, pi bonds aren't quite as strong. An example of this would be C, triple bond C, with H's on both sides, which is known as acetylene, or S, Ein, Y, N, E. The third functional group you might be aware of has a carbon attached to an oxygen that's attached to a hydrogen. This carbon usually is attached to something else, whether it be hydrogens or, I'm sorry, uh, hydrogens or more carbons. And when an OH is stuck in the end of a chain, end of a chain, it is called an alcohol. Alcohol. It ends in O-L. O-L, ol. The simplest alcohol would be one carbon in the chain with an OH at the end, and this would be called methanol. Notice the OL ending. If there were two carbons in the chain, it would be called ethanol. Three, propanol. Sometimes these are also called just something alcohols. And so another name that you see a lot of is methyl alcohol. That's another semi-systematic name that's used. But technically, you should just use an OL at the end. You could have more than one OH somewhere, and then it would be a diol for two, triol if there were three. Rarely, but you see those sometimes. The third type are when there's an oxygen in the middle of a chain. This oxygen is known as an oxygen linkage or an ether linkage. And the prefix of the suffix is just the word ether. An example of this is if we had CH3 connected to an O to another CH3. Notice we have a methyl group on this side, a methyl group on this side, and so it's known as dimethyl ether. <coughs> Two methyls, therefore the prefix di, held together by an ether linkage, which is this oxygen group right here. Next, our halo alkanes. Halo alkanes have the prefix halo on the front of them. And generally, what they have is the name of the particular halogen. So chloro, bromo, iodo, whatever halogen is attached to it. And generally, it's just a carbon atom. And then it's attached to some halogen. I'll just use X right now, because X can represent chlorine, a bromine, or iodine, and I guess it could be fluorine too, but that's less 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 common. But it, but but it's around. An example of this would be a carbon with three hydrogens around it, with a chlorine attached to it. Notice all the unshared pairs of electrons around the chlorine. This would be called chloromethane. Single bonds all around, so the A N E ending. Chloro, because there's a chlorine attached to it. Now, if it's a longer chain hydrocarbon, five carbons, for example, and the chlorine happened to be in the middle, you'd have to number the substituent groups so the chlorine had the lowest possible number. And so if it was what I said, five carbons in a row and a car chlorine in the middle, it'd be called three chloropentane. Next time, it's called an amine. And the ending is amine. Now, in an amine, there's a carbon 
attached to a nitrogen group that has an unshared pair of electrons and two things bonded off of it. Two things bonded off of it. These amines are actually quite common and they're generally bases. An example of this would be if I had a carbon chain and connected to the carbon chain was a nitrogen and the nitrogen had two hydrogens coming off of it. The ending is amine and since there's two carbons in a row I would call it ethyl amine. Ethyl amine. Now there is a possibility that the amino group could come off some other substituent as a substituent group off of a different carbon. And then you would have to number where it comes from. But I don't think I'd worry about that. These generally act basic though. As you can see, there's this unshared pair of electrons right here. This unshared pair of electrons is a good acceptor of protons. And remember that bases are usually good proton acceptors. The next group is called aldehydes. An aldehyde ends in AL, AL. Be careful, AL and OL are sometimes confused. Aldehydes, though, are structurally different. They have a double bonded oxygen at the end of a carbon chain. A double bonded oxygen at the end of a carbon chain. An example of this would be a carbon chain of two carbons. And at the end, we have a double bonded oxygen. Notice the unshared pairs of electrons on the oxygen. And of course, the hydrogen is there at the end as well to complete the four bonds around the carbon. This would be known as S-N-L. Notice the A-L ending because it is an aldehyde. This is also known as acetaldehyde. Because if you remember, there's acetic acid that's got two carbons in it too. And we'll find that out in just a second. Next, something called a ketone. A ketone ends in own, O-N-E. That's the prefix, the suffix, own, ketone, ends in own. This is when there's a double bonded oxygen in the middle of a carbon chain. In the middle of a carbon chain. Now, when there's a double bonded oxygen in the middle of the carbon chain, if it's right in the middle, you don't have to use any identifying numbers. But if there's more than one, or if they're in a difficult place, then you usually have to say where the own, the double bonded oxygen is. Here's a simple one. Three chain carbon. Oops. Hydrogen's bonded around these carbons. And on the center, a double bonded oxygen. This would be known as propanone. Notice how it ends in O-N-E, and it's a propane, one, two, three carbons in a row, propanone. The next type is known as a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid. A carboxylic acid contains the structural formula C, double bond O, O, H. And if you remember from our study of acids and bases in carboxylic acids, this H is the acidic hydrogen and is cleaved off and given away because acids are good proton donors. And then a resonance sets up between this double bond and this single bond and they end up sharing. That's what makes the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid fairly stable depending on how, how large the carboxylic acid uh, chain is, it can be pretty good. The ending for this is oic acid. And a good example of this is if we have C, H3, C, double bond O, O, H. And this is known as ethanoic acid, or sometimes people call it acetic acid. That's kind of the slang name for it, not the standard name. But that's what CH3COOH comes from, that structural group. The next group is called an ester. 
Esters are a little bit stranger. They have a C double bond O. Then they have an ether linkage of an oxygen connected to another carbon chain. This double bond O, O linkage right here is known as an ester linkage. Esters always end in O8. O8. I always think they end in eight because esters are generally responsible for smells, many of them good, like smells of bananas, cherries, smells of various fruits. And so usually you think of esters as smelling pretty good, although there are some really nasty smelling esters as well. A good example of an ester is a CH3 or methyl group connected to a carbon that has a double bond, it oxygen on it, the oxygen linkage, and then another methyl group on the end. To name these, you name the group connected to the ether linkage first, methyl, and then you name this group right here, in case, case it's two carbons, and you put the O8 ending on it. So methyl ethanoate, methyl ethanoate or sometimes it's called methyl acetate because acetate is like the slang name for two carbons in a row. And finally, our last group is known as an amide or an amide. In this, we have carbon with a double bond to an oxygen, and then it's linked to a nitrogen. And the nitrogen is linked to two other things. And its ending is amide or amide. An example of this would be a CH3 connect to a C double bond O to a nitrogen who's connected to two other things, in this case hydrogens. And you can see how this would also act as a pretty good base because this nitrogen would have some unshared pairs of electrons that wouldn't mind sharing or giving them away to a um, hydrogen and climbing onto it. To name this, we named the ethyl group and then, after calling it ethane or ethan, we add the amide ending to it. Ethanamide or ethanamide, or sometimes it's called acetamide as well. This is our functional groups. You need to know what functional group has what type of compound and maybe an example and some of the ways of uh, uh, naming them. Generally, you can have notes when you do that type of quiz, but don't be surprised if these types of substances show up on an AP exam too, because they like to use them as examples, like I pointed out, as different acids, and of course, as different bases, or base down here. And sometimes they'll use them as halogenation reactions and looking at uh, just different reactions that they'll undergo and using basic stoichiometry or equilibria to try to describe them. Now, your textbook goes through and looks at each one of these classifications individually. And it looks at alcohols and some of the reactions of those on pages 108, 4, and 5 of your text in the 10th edition. Then it goes and talks about ethers. And then it continues to talk about aldehydes and ketones. And continues on with acids, carboxylic acids. Lastly, it talks about esters. And finally, it talks about amines and amides or amides as being the bases of the group. They generally act as pretty good proton acceptors. This ends on about page 1091 in the 10th edition of your text. One of the last things we're going to talk about in this chapter is something called chirality. C-H-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y. Chiral, from the Greek word C-H-E-I-R, meaning hand, are compounds that contain carbon atoms with four different groups attached to a carbon atom. And chiral molecules actually have a really unique characteristic. The example given in your textbook is this carbon. 
who's got a bromine attached to it on one side, a hydrogen attached to it on another, a methyl group attached to it on this side, and over here, it has a propyl group. And notice this carbon in particular right here has th four different substituent groups attached to it. And when you attach these groups, you can build them in three dimensions in two different ways. Two different ways. And I think it's best to show you on page 1091 the picture of these two different ways of building the molecule. If you look at them on the bottom of the page, you can see right here that the one on the left-hand side, the one on the left-hand side has the bromine up in the top, and you can see that the methyl group is down on the right-hand side. And you can see the hydrogen is down way over here on the left-hand side. And you'll see that if you put a mirror up to it, the non-superimposable mirror image of it is actually an isomer of the first one. Chiral molecules always have non-superimposable mirror images that are isomers of one another. These optical isomers are called enantiomers. Organic chemists use different labels to distinguish the two forms of these molecules. In class, we'll actually build some enantiomers, and you'll be able to see that they're non-superimposable. This becomes actually quite important in various drugs because just the way that they're connected in their chiral centers causes them to act different ways. Going on further, your book talks just a little bit in uh, a small, small way about biochemistry and just a little introduction to how these carbon compounds come together to form the basic building blocks of living or once living things. One of the cool things that I like to touch on are both ones that we've talked about in the class before. And these are things that are both an acid and a base at the same time. And these are called amino acids. And of course, maybe in bio, you've learned biology, you've learned that there are a number of different amino acids. And as a matter of fact, a whole bunch of the uh, 22 uh, amino acids that have been identified in nature are listed on page 1094 of your textbook. One example of an amino acid is this one. H2N, notice there's an unshared pair of electrons on the end, is connected to a carbon, who's connected to a hydrogen, who connected to some type of carbon chain. I'll call it R, because it could be just a hydrogen or it could be something else. And then this is connected to a carbon who has a double bonded oxygen, who's connected to an OH. Notice this side of the molecule right here acts as a carboxylic acid, whereas this side of the molecule right here acts as an amine. And an amine, remember, acts as a base. So we have one side of the molecule that's very willing to accept protons, and then we have another side of the molecule here that's willing to give away a proton. This amino acid can actually react with itself sometimes, where it will give off a hydrogen and accept the hydrogen on this side, forming an ion that's fairly stable because it will form this resonance with the double bonds right here, giving it more of a negative charge over here and more of a positive charge over here, forming something that has a really cool name. I believe it's called a Zwitter ion. This starts with a Z and then a W. And it's talked a little bit more back in, about in, uh, back in chapter 16 as well. Of course, you can notice right away that this carbon right here in the center of the amino acid is chiral because, of course, it's connected to two different, I mean, four different possible um, four different possible substituent groups. And when that happens, of course, then you get enantiomers or chiral, non-superimposable, um, non-superimposable um, enantiomers of one another. This complicates 
the amino acid chemistry. This ends the talk on organic chemistry right now, and if you'd like to continue with the biochem area, look on page 195, 1095, and further in uh, the portion of your textbook that is uh, up on biochemistry. We'll be doing a number of problems naming these structures, identifying them, identifying their families, and then being able to talk about if they're chiral or not. We'll take a look at the functional groups, all of these that we've looked at. We'll take a look at aromatic alkenes and alkynes. We'll look at saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons and do zillions of these problems in class. Thank you for watching the Organic Chem Videocast.